Committee will come to order. I'm going to uh, begin a second round of questioning of uh, Mr. Kashkari. Thank you for remaining here, and uh, if uh, necessary, we'll have a third round. We will soon be going to the second and third panels, and I appreciate the patience of all of the witnesses, and I appreciate the uh, continued presence of, uh, of all members, and the uh, House is just finishing up on votes. I expect we'll have uh, some more questions. I'd, I'd, like, to, I'd like to begin, uh, Mr. Kashgari, uh, and point out that you're familiar that GAO has testified, uh, and will testify today, that they are still concerned about the TARP's inability to track the use of TARP funds and that the challenges are going to grow as the TARP programs grow. The Special Inspector General will testify today that, and I quote, if by percentage terms some of the estimates of fraud in recent government programs apply to the TARP programs, we are looking at the potential exposure of hundreds of billions of dollars in taxpayer money lost to fraud, unquote, and that is a direct quote. Can you, Mr. Kashkari, point to anything Treasury is currently doing to prevent waste, fraud, and abuse of funds from the uh, CPP program? Uh, thank you, Chairman. <coughs> um, first, uh, as I mentioned previously, we rely very heavily on the regulators when assessing banks in, who have applied to invest for funds. So the banks excuse me, the banks apply to the regulators, regulators make a recommendation to Treasury. The regulators have been regulating these institutions in most cases for years. Some cases they have people on site. Is, isn't, it, isn't it true, though, <coughs> that regulators look for uh, fraud, they don't look for waste and abuse? I, I think the regulators look at the entire business operations to look at how well managed the banks are. But, but you're saying TARP doesn't look at it, you defer to the regulators. We, we work closely with the regulators, sir. But, but TARP, you work closely with it, but your mission, as you see it, isn't to look for this, is that right? Uh, our mission is- Isn't to look for waste, fraud, and abuse? We want to use the taxpayers' dollars efficiently and protect the taxpayers. And so we, we do it a number of different ways. In part, we do it in concert with the regulators. In part, we put contractual provisions in governing what banks can do and cannot do. But, but you don't look at uses. That, that's what I'm trying to get to. I, I really am looking at the function <coughs> of the TARP here. You know, we, we understand that you've taken this responsibility on and that you've agreed to stay to help with the transition. I understand that. We're trying to understand the systemic situation here because if we don't know that Treasury is currently doing something to prevent waste, fraud, and abuse from funds from the CPP program, and we don't know for sure that, you, that, the, that your operation is looking at it, then how can, and the question comes, how can, how can you find fraud if you don't know how they're using the money? Does that, is that a fair question? It, it, of course it's a fair question, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Let me g just give an example of some of the compliance procedures we've built in. We have procedures that we're putting in place where CEOs must certify to Treasury that the statements they make to Treasury are correct, that they're I, I, meeting. I, I got the procedures. I just want to, you know, I, and, I, and excuse me for interrupting you, sure. but I, I got two minutes left. Uh, I understand that Treasury is doing its best to understand impact. And I'm sure you are aware of GAO skepticism, that you'll be, uh, that you, whether or not you're going to be able to do it. But as you know, promoting financial stabilization is only one of two goals of the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act. The other is public accountability. I'd like to read from a legal memo prepared by the Congressional Research for this hearing, and I call my colleagues' attention to this. According, and, and I move to put the entire memorandum in, uh, in the record of this hearing. According to, to this memorandum from uh, Congressional Research, this is a quote, given, I go on to say, the objective of ensuring that the authorities and <coughs> facilities provided to the Secretary of Treasury, that is the TARP funds, are used in a manner that, quote, maximizes overall returns to taxpayers, inner quotes, and provides, inner quotes, public accountability, the internal control system that TARP is required to establish arguably should include monitoring how those funds are being used by recipients. It goes on to say, therefore, it appears that TARP overseers 
we'll need to gather information on at least those recipients' major financial transactions, particularly in those areas that have been the primary areas of concern, executive compensation, payment of dividends, purchase of other banks, and certain types of marketing <coughs> promotions. This, of course, means naming rights, for instance, which um, is, uh, you know, mentioned in a memo. At this time, does Treasury at least gather information on recipients' major financial transactions on an individually identifiable basis? Uh, Chairman, may I provide a thorough answer, sir? Can, can you give me a yes or no, though? Well, we do not ask for transaction okay. by transaction so do, data. So the answer is no. The an but I'd like to, if I may, sir, I'd like to provide a thorough response. Okay, you can respond, and then my time has expired, and then we'll go to Mr. Jordan, but we're, we're going to come back on this question. Thank you, sir. Uh, the internal control provision that you're referring to in the law, I have it in front of me, uh, specifies that Treasury shall establish an effective system of, of internal controls. We have PricewaterhouseCoopers working with us developing the internal controls within Treasury. We have spoken with both the GAO, the Special IG, and Treasury's own uh, analysis. This provision about the use of TARP resources is about Treasury's use of TARP resources. The law does not direct us to uh, impose internal controls over the 500 banks that we've invested in, just to be precise. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're gonna, I'll, I'll come back to that in the next round of questioning. Uh, we're going to go to Mr. Uh, Jordan. Thank Mr. You, Jordan, you're recognized yeah, for five minutes. Mr. Kashkari, I want to go back to where I was about an hour and a half ago with, with this, this whole concept. And again, I was one of the individuals who did not vote for the, the, uh, the TARP program back uh, last fall. But uh, here's what I'm trying to understand. Uh, you, you know, you're a sharp guy. Um, Tim Geithner is a sharp guy. Hank Paulson's a sharp guy. Ben Bernanke is a smart guy. How was it that um, back in October, October 3rd, that all of you were convinced and, and the package was uh, sold to the Congress that you were going to be able to, wh what did you think then that was going to allow you to go after the toxic assets, the troubled assets, that since then you haven't been able to do? I mean, it, it was this assurance that members got, the public got, the taxpayers got, that you could in fact clear the bad stuff out and things would get moving back towards normal and yet now five months later still not there so tell me what you what you thought you knew but yet found out you didn't really know walk me through that again if you can uh, thank you I'm happy to when we went to the Congress you're right we talked about and the plan was to purchase mortgage related assets in large volumes to get those markets moving again uh, the crisis intensified so much just in the few, in just in the two weeks we were negotiating with Congress and the one or two weeks that followed, that we had to move even faster. Dollar for dollar, putting a dollar of capital in goes much further, as you I'm sure understand with leverage, than just buying a dollar of assets. So we had to take the most aggressive action we could to stabilize the system. So that's why we ended up leading with capital. Mm -hmm. Now, for an asset purchase program to work, it must be done in very, very large scale. Once we concluded in the fall, that we had to allocate almost half of the money for a capital program, and we had these one-off contingencies that we had to deal with. We were left with fewer resources, and the question was, would if we only spent half the money on asset purchases, would it be big enough in light of the $14 trillion residential and commercial mortgage market? What Secretary Geithner has done is saying, look, let's take the available resources, let's combine it with the private sector and leverage it up so we can increase our purchasing power and go make a big dent on a very big market. And so it's just, it's about speed of implementation, mm -hmm. it's about impact, and it's about scale with which to go at the problem. Let me ask you another question. Uh, and and uh, talking with some folks, reading about this, this phenomenon, uh, would you uh, agree that the mark-to-market concept is, is good in, in, the, in, the, in the framework of disclosure, but not so good in, 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 a, uh, in the context of, of, in the regulatory context? Is, is, and it, and if so, are there some reforms we can do that kind of fit that statement that are going to help us as we move forward? I think the mark-to-market -market issue has a lot of benefits, and I think it is good in terms of disclosure for investors. But keep in mind, right now we have an environment where investors are questioning the value and the meaning of regulatory capital standards. Mm -hmm. And so if we said, well, there's going to be one set of standards for the books that the investors get to see, but don't worry, there's, a, there's a, a different set of standards 
for regulators to use, that may not support more confidence for investors as they look at the institutions. I think mark to market is a very important issue. I know the SEC has recently done a study on it, and I think we need to look at it as we go you ahead with regulatory reform. You personally, reform. What, what, what do you think, if any, changes can be made to that, to the mark to market um, rule that can be positive? Uh, well, let me go back. Do you, do you agree that there's, there's some potential with what I just described, mark to market in a disclosure sense, but uh, some, some amending in the, in the regulatory context? I think that that is something that's worth looking at. I'll tell you, I'm probably not the best. There are better experts than me on uh, the accounting treatment of mark to market versus accrual accounting, for example, and in the regulatory context. I think that these are things we should look at, but I, especially in the middle of the crisis that we're in, mm -hmm. I think we should be cautious about making changes that seem like a good idea at the time. I think we need to get through this crisis, we need to have a thoughtful discussion, analyze these issues, and then make the long-term changes that we need to make. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Tierney. Thank you. Thanks for coming back, Mr. Kishkar. We appreciate it. Um, Earlier we talked about the fact that uh, you're going to have these partnerships that are going to be partly with taxpayer money and partly with other investors going out and getting the bad assets. And I mentioned that some of them might be hedge fund people that taxpayers might think we're getting benefited after already doing things that cause part of the problem. And you said that you thought instead that most of the money would come from pensions or other investors. So given the fiduciary responsibilities of uh, people that run these pension funds and giving the stressed nature of these troubled assets, what is the sales pitch that you're going to make to them to think that they can invest in them and still meet their fiduciary responsibility? Because now I know there are a lot of people that have an interest in those pensions going to be sitting out there going, oh, my God, that's what, where our money's going to go? Um, well, thanks for providing me the opportunity to follow up. <coughs> if you look at pension plans, big pension plans, and retirement programs for teachers or, or government workers or employees, they allocate different parts of that money to different classes of investments. They'll allocate some to government securities, some to equities, some to alternative asset classes such as private equity or even hedge funds. And those are typically much smaller asset classes, much smaller segments. So it would not surprise me to see major pension funds saying, okay, we're going to put a small slice of this towards real estate assets or mortgage-related assets because we think the, tr the prices over the long term are, are attractive. And so I don't want to give anybody the impression that huge pockets of people's pension plans are going to be put at this. But I think if you look at the amount of savings we have as a country, retirement savings, small slices can add up to big dollars. Okay. So you're basically saying to them that it's, it'll be a good investment for that small slice to go in and buy these toxic assets. So you, with your other investments, one little slice of it ought to go toward really troubled assets. I think that that's a, that's a reasonable position that portfolio managers are going to be looking at and, and analyzing as they make their decisions. Okay. Um, all right. I, I would think that you might get some of the hedge funds to do it, but I think people, unless they can see a bigger upside on, on that, it, it's going to be a stretch for them to do that. Uh, can you, just following up on another question that was asked earlier about AIG, and Mr. Welch had asked about uh, can't we favor uh, those in, uh, people that AIG is dealing with as co-partners or whatever over a uh, certain other group that uh, maybe ought not to be favored as much. And you said, well, if we do that, if we discriminate with one set of people against another, then the remaining people can bring the company into bankruptcy. Can you explain to us how it is that they're able to do that, or I'll do that. And secondly, what would be the consequences of AIG's bankruptcy? Uh, thank you. I if I have a contract with a financial institution and that financial institution just des decides not to honor my contract, I have recourse. I can sue them uh, as a creditor. Uh, I don't know the different legal requirements. Uh, a group of creditors could come together and say, okay, you haven't honored your obligation to me. You may have paid off your policyholders, but you haven't honored your commitments to me. I'm going to go to the courts to try to get my money, and which may end up pushing the company in bankruptcy, uh, et cetera. So again, this is something that, as I indicated earlier, nobody wanted to do. But the unfortunate consequence of bailing out an institution is you help everybody in the institution, you really don't get to pick or choose. Now, if we had allowed AIG to go into bankruptcy, uh, not only would potentially, AIG has 30 million policyholders in the U.S., 30 million. Not only could those policyholders be put at risk, but all of the businesses that AIG provides insurance for, all of their business customers around the world, I think they operate more than 100 in 100 countries, could all be 
exposed to some type of financial risk. Uh, there could be various collateral calls from other institutions. And so the, the judgment was not, we like AIG or we want to help AIG. It was the system as a whole could be put at risk if this were allowed to go into bankruptcy, especially at a time when the financial markets are still uh, in a state of low confidence. Yeah, your, your feeling is that all 30 million of those people would lose their policies, that the businesses would all go under, that this whole thing would be such a tragedy you couldn't, you couldn't risk it, or that you just have an uncertainty that nobody wants to risk? I think that there's a large uncertainty, and the downside, the risks of the downside are much larger than even the large dollars that we're having to spend to support the institution. I don't want to suggest that everybody's policies would be gone. I think that's an overstatement, mm -hmm. but I think that there'd be a lot of risk for everybody uh, that is a customer or a counterparty or a partner of AIG in any, in any respect. Thank you. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Souter, you may proceed for five minutes. I wanted to follow up again on some credit questions. Uh, that uh, I have 58% uh, of the RV market in the country in my district. I have the Silverado and Sierra uh, biggest GM pickup plant. Uh, and I need the credit opened up. And I wanted to illustrate a, a couple of different things. Uh, uh, Congressman uh, Donnelly DeFazio and I had a, uh, an amendment uh, to the car, truck, motorcycle that included RVs on retail floor plan financing. Uh, because part of the problem in retail floor plan financing, and let me deal with the RV, the auto has a similar, is, is that there were basically three major companies that did it, Textron, GE Capital. They pulled out. You can't sell anything if you can't get it to a dealer. That, uh, that these are fairly large purchases, particularly for, for motorhomes, and nobody would take the market. So we tried to get a tranche set. It, 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 was, it didn't pass the Senate, it was a House advisory. Uh, and that the similar, one of the problems here is, is that in American manufacturing, because of legacy costs, because of health and pension and our wage rate, we make bigger vehicles. The smaller stuff tends not to be American made. So they require bigger and longer term investments. Let me give you one illustration. In one lot in a major city in the south, they tried to ha clear their lot of some of the uh, RVs and motorhomes. That the, uh, they sold eight, which was not a good sale day. Uh, of those eight, two were in the 350 to 500,000 range. Uh, four were in the uh, 100 to 250 range, and two were used towables under 25,000. All had credit scores, the buyers, of over 700. Only one was actually financed, and it was a $15,000 used towable. The reason is, is that they, nobody wants to take a 15-year, $500,000 mortgage right now, uh, partly going back to the mark-to-market question, which I need to point out, assumes that you're going to liquidate the premise underneath it. So the combination of the retail floor financing and the lack of for bigger purchases is hammering the car, auto, truck, RV markets. And unless we can figure out how to get some liquidity into that system, Fleetwood declared bankruptcy this morning. Uh, they're going all over the place. It's spilling into manufactured housing. Uh, and, and we try to address a little of the housing in, in the, with housing credits. But this is a, a huge double problem, compounded by, and one other thing I wanted to, to raise to you as you look at how to handle this, that there are buybacks, which the auto companies are starting to get into, but the RV industry, that aren't on their books. They've never had a problem before because when one dealer can't sell it, they move it to another dealer. But if they can't get retail floor planning, all of a sudden this stuff is coming back, out they go. Uh, thousands of people being laid off when, in fact, there appears to be some market. How do we open that credit market up if they don't know in the lending institutions what their assets are? That's why we keep bringing up the variation of mark to market. Uh, Congressman, thank you. This is a huge issue. It is a huge issue that we are, we have teams of people working on. And this goes back to the new facility under the Consumer and Business Lending Initiative. It's called the TALF program that the Federal Reserve has set up. It's going to start funding in a couple weeks. It's, it's ready now. It's finally launched. That's going to specifically bring down costs of borrowing for auto loans, for credit cards, for student loans, for small business loans. Right now, as a starting point, it's a $200 billion facility. We have a plan to increase it to a trillion dollar facility and to add other asset classes. So we are looking 
at all different sorts of asset classes to see what else we can put in there to get liquidity to the markets so that people can buy motorhomes and RVs and cars and trucks, et cetera, uh, until we get through this crisis. So I assure you, Congressman, we are focused on this too. We get the same calls you get, not as many as you get because it's your district, but we get the same calls you get. We know it's a real problem and we think we're on the right track to bring down these borrowing costs because who can go afford today and buy a car and pay a 14 or 15 percent loan? No one's going to do it. We need to bring these rates down so that our businesses can continue to do business. And there, and there needs to be some kind of addressing of this uh, size, volume of, of loan and length of loan question. Uh, some of the RV people had talked to me initially about could they pool but with a, a, a fee such that to help share if some went bad. Uh, there's got to be some kind of risk sharing on the longer term and sizable loans or that market will not free up. And, and those tend to be our American manufacturers because we're skewed to the higher value ends. And uh, those big areas, construction and auto truck, I believe are close to 50 percent of much of our uh, American uh, hmm. economy. The retail sales, if you, if you take uh, a manufacturing job or a value added, which could be software or whatever, is going to circulate different at a different rate in a productivity and multiplier effect than a service job or a uh, labor intensive job. And that sector is overwhelmingly tied to construction and auto. It yeah. intends to go boom bust. But the way the, the financial markets have collapsed so deeply, it's not clear how we get it restarted, especially if the uh, debt that the government's taking on starts to crowd out private borrowing and private equity. They're going to be, and mark to markets chewing them up, which was a change. Uh, it's not a, when you say it's a problem changing back, it was a change to it that partly triggered this. Uh, that that uh, it, it's not clear how we reopen the credit market because well, capital is going to be so tight. Well, Congressman, uh, we think the new facility that the Fed has set up is going to help restart not just the market and get rates down, but bring private capital back because the way it's designed, it's designed that the private sector puts in capital, the government lends to it, gets the markets going again, and then our hope is as the credit markets heal themselves that the private sector will be able to go back and then the government can step back, st can step away. So we're focused on this. The only other thing I would add, don't forget the administration has an auto task force, a whole team of people focused just on the autos to try to get them to a place of long-term viability. And so there's a team working there, Treasury, it's an interagency program looking at autos, looking at auto suppliers, looking at some of their financing constraints as well. So we're coming at it from both directions. I think the gentleman uh, chair recognizes Mr. Cummings. Mr. Kashkari, um, the um, you know there are, there are a lot of banks that that are returning their money. Is that right? They want to return the money. Yes. And they apparently want to return this TARP money because of restrictions and the things that you talked about a little bit earlier that the Obama administration is. Uh, demanding and the public is demanding. Um, how do you feel about that? I'm just curious, I mean, in, in just in a few words, because I got some other things I want to ask sure. you. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned because in many cases the banks that want to return the money, or in, we've got 200 banks that we've approved that have said no thank you. And in most cases, the ones that are saying no thank you or who express an interest to return are the strongest, healthiest of our institutions. Those are the very ones we want to take more capital because they're in the best position to extend credit. And so I, I understand, well, in any case. Well, now, now that leads me to something else now. Um, so they're the stronger, the stronger banks. They want to give the money back because they don't want to go uh, abide by the Obama and rules. President Obama's rules, and it seems like then they, they should be in a better position, particularly if they had the money, to make the loans. And so it sounds like they are more, they might be more interested in continuing to operate as usual, as opposed to seeing our economy come out of this great slump that we're in. I'm just curious. <clears throat> it's a it's a tough it's a tough problem to answer with precision because yeah. 
as I indicated earlier, 60% of our credit is from banks, 40% is non-banks. I know the 40% is not wor working right now. We're trying to get that going. If you look at the lending survey that we did do, which covers the majority of the banks in the country in terms of dollars, lending has held up remarkably well. A lot of banks, especially the smaller banks, will say they're just scared because they're hearing so much noise out of Washington. They're saying, do I really need the, the headache of taking this additional money? I know if I took additional money, I could put it to work, but there's so much coming out of Washington right now. They're calling us and saying, you know what? No, thank you. I just, I don't know, wh I don't know what's coming, and so no thank you. And so we're disappointed by that because we want the strongest banks to take more money because they can turn around and extend credit. So you already said in your statement that you didn't feel that uh, public officials like you have any business telling banks how to lend because they're in a better position to do it, to, to make those determinations. And I don't know how you can say that with a straight face. After all, a lot of these banks uh, did some poor decision making well, and got us into this mess. And so I'm just wondering, and I, and I know about that latitude that you talked about, but I'm wondering this new, the new program that you're talking about with regard to the auto loans and freeing up the money, how does that work? And how might that have effect on banks negatively or positively? Um, this, this program is a Federal Reserve, we call it a facility, where the Fed says they will lend money to people who buy securities. So new securities, a bunch of auto loans are packaged together, they meet certain standards, an investor wants to buy those securities, they can get a loan from the Federal Reserve to buy those securities. The investor has to put in some of their own money, gotcha. and then they'll have that for up to three years. And so it enables private capital to come off the sidelines to get money into these markets with the federal government providing some of the lending to those investors. So mm -hmm. it, it's, it is complicated, but the market, the investors have said they really want it. And you know, the, the car companies and the student loan companies and the small business companies have all said this, is, this should really help them by bringing down rates for borrowers. At the end of the day, this program is all about bringing down rates for our consumers. And how does that affect the banks? Well, the banks in this case. What, what's your hope? The banks in this case are not, th it's not the main priority of this program. This program is about getting lending to consumers. The banks have a role to play because they're the ones who buy all these auto loans, package them up, and then sell them to investors. So the banks have a role, but this is not about the banks extending credit. This is about getting credit going from the non-banking market to the, to the consumers and to the car buyers. I got you. I got you. And so, so but I was just wondering if, if this then establishes some kind of competition. In other words, these are people who are borrowing money from a non-bank. Correct. And so I'm just wondering how much competition that uh, gives to the banks and whether that spurs any activity possible. I, I think it's a good thing. I mean, I you think may, you may respond uh, and, oh, and then uh, uh, the gentleman's time has expired, you, but Chairman. please respond. Thank you, Chairman. I think the more diverse sources we have of credit in our economy, the better we're going to be. And so we need to get the non-banking market going. Uh, we need the banks to do more, but we really need to get the non-banking market going. That's where the big hole is right now. And so we need all of it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're going to go to round three. Uh, Mr. Kashkari, picking up where we left off, you said that Treasury's internal controls need apply only to Treasury and not to the banks that have sold equity to Treasury. Uh, no. Yes, Congressman. I'm referring to the internal control provision in the I ESO. I understand, but I, I would uh, gently remind you that that view is somewhat extreme, that it's, it's at odds with legal analysis of your duties to monitor the use of TARP funds uh, by the banks that got them. Uh, C CRS has, uh, has spoken to this directly, and it's not alone. The GAO is also of the opinion that your legal duty is to monitor the use of TARP funds by the banks which receive them. It seems to me that you may be alone in the view that Congress didn't mean what it said in Section 116 of the EESA. We told you in there that we wanted Treasury to safeguard the TARP monies from waste and abuse. 
that is the meaning of the incorporation of the Federal Manager's Financial Integrity Act, Title 31, Section 3512C. And I think that you are taking a position that is not tenable and one that is pointedly lacking in uh, responsibility for the office that, that you hold. And uh, that is that you just say it's not your job. Now, uh, granted, you have come in under extraordinary circumstances, but we have a new administration coming in. And I'm hopeful they're going to take a fresh look at this law. And uh, if you want to comment on what I said, you'd feel free to, and then I've got some follow-up. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, we take protecting taxpayers' money extraordinarily seriously, extraordinarily seriously. What I was referring to is the, you know, the section you're referring to, the internal control provision of the ESA. I personally spoke with the GAO and the Special Inspector General about their interpretation of this, and they agreed with me, and you'll hear from them on the third panel, they agreed with our assessment that this internal control provision is talking about Treasury's own internal controls within Treasury, and we've, we're working, we've made a lot of progress on our own internal controls. So you're controls. saying that, that you, you publicly acknowledge that you have a responsibility for the internal controls of the TARP funds once they go to the banks? No, no. I'm saying we have a responsibility for internal controls within the Treasury organization, and we have responsibilities to the taxpayers to make sure the money is used appropriately and in the best policy interests of the country. But the internal control provision is very narrowly focused. That doesn't mean we don't have to protect the taxpayers. We have other mechanisms for Are protecting the taxpayers. Are you saying Congress was not uh, specific enough in its uh, charge to, to you? Uh, I've been advised, and Congressman, or Chairman, forgive me, I'm not an attorney. I've been advised by our lawyers at Treasury that Section 3512C of Title 31 United States Code is specifically about internal procedures within federal government agencies. A and that's what we're referring to. That's what the law refers to right here on line 16. Uh, we're going to hear more about this point in the third panel. We don't think it's arcane. We think it relates directly to your responsibilities. When we began this day talking about how banks who got TARP funds are moving the money out of the country, uh, it's, it's my opinion, and apparently the opinion of some members of this panel, uh, that there should be accountability from the Treasury Department as to, as to U.S. taxpayers' funds being spent by TARP recipients in, in other countries, especially when we have such dire straits here. Now, in the time that I, that I have remaining on this uh, particular round, uh, I, I want to uh, talk about the, the impact of the uh, TARP funds. Uh, Congress has heard repeatedly the representations of large TARP recipients about the billions of dollars of new credit they're creating. They're eager to tell the side of the story, and you've repeated them today. You state on page 10 of your testimony that all loan amounts appear to be going up. But the lending is much reduced compared to the period before the crisis. Isn't that so? Yes, as I indicated. Oh, okay. okay, please. But then what about the other side of the picture? Are you collecting data from the banks on a contraction of existing credit that is occurring? Now, this goes to some of the questions Mr. Souders raised. Where have you shown the decline in credit due to foreclosures and a suspension of credit lines that our constituents are experiencing? How do those numbers compare to past periods? And, Mr. Kashkir, if the new credit doesn't more than offset the extinction of existing credit, does the economy experience a net positive effect from credit activities or a net negative effect? And do you have a, if you can respond to that, and my time has expired. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, there's no question that in recessions, credit levels fall because both lenders and borrowers are nervous about taking on new obligations and extending credit. There's no question about that. And when we look at the lending levels that we're seeing, we know that they're higher than they would have been absent the TARP funds. We think they've held up remarkably well in light of the severe economic contraction we had in Q4. But again, as I look at the, the broader credit problem, the banking sector is part of it. A much bigger problem at this point is the securitization market, the non-banking sector. So banking is not as high as we'd like it to be. Securitization is zero. And it was 40% before this started. So we need to get that going, too. Yeah, I, my time's expired. I just want to comment that um, there is no time in the history of this country have we ever had a period where was, we're in a recession and there's massive amounts of federal dollars by the time this thing is through, maybe trillions of federal dollars going in to prop up the economy, and where's the money going in terms of a net new credit uh, to report to us. Uh, Mr. Souter. 
I want to uh, continue along this a, a little bit. Clearly because of Enron, we, we had to look at what I guess is called uh, uh, fair value measurements, which is mark to market. Um, and that uh, the, the challenge here that we have, because that went in in November 2007, so to talk about a change, it appears to be one of the changes that helped trigger the credit crisis, uh, with all due, due respect, because it exposed those who were not fair marketed value and then caused a panic beyond that because it was a broad swipe at everybody's valuation when in fact in areas of the country like mine we had been having two three percent growth not a hundred percent growth in housing uh, the national went up two hundred percent while the economy is growing about three it doesn't take a rocket scientist takes business 101 to see you've got a mismatch but that mismatch was not universal so we did a universal solution that in particular, and I'm fascinated because the more you read, the more you study about this, there's been a major changing in finances in the country in securitization and moving outside the Fed regulated and into this 40% other sector that you're talking about. Yet the banks are tightly regulated and we slam fair market measurements on them. Now if we fund the securitization group, getting to Mr. Cummings' question, are they going to have to play by the same rules as banks? And then if they have to do fair market measurements, we're right back to, to where we were. There's got to be some kind of addressing an underlying concern. But let me first ask, in this trying to get the 40% securitization, are they going to come on? That was where the biggest problem were, was. Are they going to come, if they're going to compete on loans, are they going to come in under similar banking rules? <coughs> some of them are converting to banks. Correct. Uh, some, some uh, is this going to be a mandatory thing? Is there going to be a supervisory? This is where transparency starts to become a huge deal because if the problem sector really, for the most part, it was not a bank. It was a division of a bank to compete with this 40%. Yeah, the 40% uh, part is made up of a lot of different type of institutions. So you've got uh, you know, big banks like CIT, non-bank, excuse me, like CIT or GE Capital, et cetera. You have uh, pension plans, insurance companies who need to buy assets to match their liabilities. Um, you have various kind of funds all around the world. So there's, you can't, it's hard to define them as one category because there's all sorts of dogs and cats investing in the non-bank market and buying these securities. And most of them, to my understanding, are, in many cases, they are marking those securities to market. And so they do see the asset prices go up and down. So I think your points have a lot of merit. I would say the one other point in terms of accounting and transparency that's been at the root cause of this problem is it's been almost impossible to peer into these mortgage-backed securities to figure out which loans are in there, who wrote the loans, how are they doing, and because investors had a hard time peering into the mortgage-backed securities, let alone the CDOs when they were bundled together, they didn't know which mortgages were good, which securities were bad, so they pulled back from all of them. And that's, that's an example where, in, like in your district, no, where their no, home prices didn't take off, take they're suffering. It doesn't take too much time. Uh, we've had multiple hearings here, reading about Countrywide and so on, that basically if you were paying 6%, there was less risk than if you were paying 14. When you start to see the high rates of return beyond the normal rates of return, the, you know, uh, the, the, I think it's Eric Paulson who made the 3.7 billion. John, uh, John Paulson. That John. Yeah. Uh, that, um, when he was here and I asked him a similar question, he said, how do you think I made my money? Uh, that, that he could see this, anybody who was studying it could figure out which ones were inflated and which ones weren't. It, it, it wasn't like that confused, it was sloppiness. People wanted the high returns uh, there, that you had to either be in pharmaceutical speculation, energy speculation, or housing speculation if you're getting higher than six or eight percent. And that, that pension funds may have done that. I, I just, I'm not very tolerant of, of the the people who say, oh, we couldn't figure out what was going on. We need more transparency, but they weren't paying close enough attention. But in, the, in this uh, non-bank financial uh, sector, in, in, in trying to, to monitor how, how they're doing, I have, I have Lincoln Financial in my district, the center of the annuities of the country. They bought a bank because they're now applying for TARP funds. Uh, and we saw a number of others convert to banks. But you suggested that the Federal Reserve is setting up a separate fund that won't require them to be like a bank. Correct. So the, 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 the new program that the Fed has set up, the Treasury supporting, to get lending going, it's 
many, many financial participants can use it. And who's going to regulate them and what guidelines are they going to have and are there going to be similar regulations? Because while we're all in Congress obsessed about the banking sector, you're telling us that there's a 40 percent and, and the Fed is floating out $2 trillion while we're dealing with $700 billion in your fund. So th the Fed and Treasury designed very important pr procedures and restrictions to make sure we know the quality of the collateral that we're going to be getting. Because when the Fed loans in this new program, they're going to get the securities as collateral. So it's only going to be new loans, new securitizations in this, in this current program, and very strict guidelines in terms of what's eligible to make sure that we protect the taxpayers. There's not with it per se going to be new regulations that go for the people who are lending money into that system, but we're making sure the taxpayers are protected. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> um, you've painted for us a very um, stark picture in terms of what we have in front of us, and that is we have the uncertainty of the markets, um, and yet we have the necessity to act quickly. Um, we're going to be confronted with the just choice as to how to put a, uh, an end to this uncertainty by uh, putting up however many more uh, billions of dollars to, to stave off continued um, decline in, in the markets and continued um, um, uh, recession that's going to lead to further dislocation of our workers in this country. And the President has spoken very clearly of the need to act now or act later. Um, the question I have for you is, um, given the fungibility that you say, you know, these financial institutions are, are, are involved with the res respect to the m world markets, how can we be certain that the dollars that are going to be going into this public-private fund um, are dollars that are going to absolutely mean the end of the uncertainty with respect to those toxic assets when we're part of an international world economy now and, and we want to make sure that whatever final package is the final package and that there isn't going to be another shoe to drop, so to speak. I mean, that's what my constituents want to know. We want closure just as much as the President does. We want to be able to move on. We don't want this recession to drag on any further. And we also don't want to overpay for these toxic assets any more than uh, they, they have to be. But we understand that um, if we let this recession drag on, it's going to cost us a great deal. And I'd ask you to comment on this because I think this is a fundamental point that most economists have been talking about is you know, what is it that we have to put the staunch to, uh, wrap the tourniquet around, and, and uh, how do we wrap a tourniquet around something that is involved in a global uh, economy in terms of assets? Uh, thank you, Congressman. I'm going to answer your question in two parts. First part, the global nature. Uh, we cannot act alone. So we have our programs. We are consulting closely with our counterparties in other countries who are taking similar measures that are tailor-made for their system. The world leading economies all need to act, and I think that they are acting with different speeds, but they are acting, and we're going to continue to have an active dialogue to encourage all of us to move in a coordinated fashion, number one. Number two, Secretary Geithner's financial stability plan has laid out a broad framework to do this. There's not one piece of it that by itself will solve everything. We have the capital program that he's laid out to make sure our banks have enough capital, even in a worse economic environment, that they can continue to lend. That's very important. That is underway. The details are out there. Number two is the lending program that we talked about, scaling up from $200 billion to a $1 trillion to make sure our consumers and our small businesses can get the credit that they need right now. That's underway. It's going to start funding in a couple weeks. And then third is the public-private partnership that we just talked about to go after the bad assets. Not one of these tools by itself will be the final, the final solution. We believe these three tools, combined with the other tools that the Fed and other regulators have done, will get at this. Fundamentally, we have a credit crisis that has hurt our economy. And now the economy is, is looping back. 
It's a vicious cycle and it's hurting the financial system again. And so we have to go at it from the financial perspective and then the stimulus bill that the Congress passed and the President signed is also going to be very important to getting the economy going. We need to go at it from both directions. I would say that um, obviously as we've heard this morning, transparency, we need to be able to show the American public uh, just how this links to them. And, and I understand the college loans, I understand the making payroll in businesses, I understand people's vested pensions and annuities. But uh, you know, we need to make that even clearer to people because right now uh, that, that case has not been fully made. And until it's fully made, uh, we're not going to be able to come back to the American people and say to them, this is in your interest because right now they don't see it as in their interest. And, uh, and, and there's only one person who can really make that argument. That's the President of the United States. You can't have 535 members of Congress out there trying to explain to the American people how getting this financial system back on track by infusing it with more dollars is going to do this for them when all they're seeing is that, you know, kind of trickle down. They've got to understand that this is a part of the lifeblood of the economy uh, and the lifeblood of our financial system is, the, is one and the same. Um, right now, th that's not becoming very transparent, as you've seen from this hearing. And until that becomes transparent, uh, it's going to be very hard for our, the people's representatives, us, to be able to, to give the President what he needs in order to infuse uh, any more assets into this, uh, uh, into this uh, kind of recovery. So we certainly want this, this uh, to get out of this situation, but we need the really clear, you know, leadership and uh, explanation from the top, and the only the way the president can deliver it. Thank you, General, uh, gentlemen's time has expired. Um, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kashkari, you've been as good as your word. It's uh, it's been quite an afternoon, and I appreciate your time. Uh, one question I have for you earlier, I asked about if you will, push back or influence or advocacy by members of Congress. But now let's switch to the other side. Tell me about the pushback you inherently get or you're getting or resistance you're getting from the mortgage industry, from the banking industry, on m giving you the facts and figures you might need in order to better analyze the underlying assets that we so often call toxic. So far, uh, con Congressman, <coughs> Every time we've asked for data from any recipient banks, they've all complied with us because they know they need to. It's in the country's interest and their interest to comply. Uh, and that's really focused on lending levels, which many people ask us about. And as I said, we're going out to all the institutions uh, to collect the data, not just the top 20. We have not gone out and done a survey of so-called toxic assets per se. I think if we asked them for the data, they would provide it to us. We have. Again, we work closely with the regulators who have a lot of this data already. I know that the OCC, the OTS, and the FDIC, for example, collect loan level data from all of their banks and roll that up to look at what's happening in mortgages around the country. So uh, <coughs> we get the data from different places, partly from the banks, partly from the regulators. As yet, we haven't had any pushback uh, to the data that we've asked for. Okay. Uh, earlier today, uh, there was some talk about loans going to Dubai and China and other places. Isn't it true that the United States is a net debtor around the world? Yes. So if we wanted back all the money that, if you will, we've loaned in, and invested in other places and the rest of the world did the same in return, wouldn't we suddenly have trillions of dollars of shortfall far beyond what we're putting in with TARP? Uh, I believe so, yes. Okay. I just, I, I had that impression, a little CNBC and Fox Business News, it seemed that it was that way. Uh, <coughs> Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Congressman Kennedy has left, but he talked about certainty, one time, et cetera. From your standpoint, having lived with multiple tranches of different solutions, TARP being one of them, do you think we're well served by having one more, this is it, it encompasses everything, we'll never seem to come back, or should we look at smaller uh, steps with more congressional oversight? In other words, do what you think is right, come back to us and tell us what you've done, uh, rather than the $700 billion, which, as by your own admission, really never got used in the original way and will be probably gone before we begin buying those assets in any great numbers. 
So I, I don't want to say that he was wrong, but wouldn't you say the opposite is true, that, that we should ask for careful and deliberate actions, even if they're not complete, agree to those, authorize you, and then have you come back when you learn more? I think that there's merit in that, I, but I'm, I'm cautious because sometimes we have to take action that is so unpleasant, but it's so urgent. We just have to move. Sure, and, and, so and I'm not suggesting little teeny sizes, but uh, the 700 billion, which was 350, 350, represented uh, by your own statement at least 489 different transactions. So going forward, you don't need a trillion all at once next time. Uh, that in fact, although we may authorize and anticipate a trillion, the 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 periodic reporting that we could expect in a TARP two. Uh, and the updates and the increments could, in fact, be more manageable because we're not dealing with an overnight crisis in which you don't know how much you need to put out, but you might need to put it all out in one day, so to speak. Uh, I think it could be, and I think that this is consistent with the way Secretary Geithner is thinking about it because his new programs, we can get going with the available capital we have. <coughs> we can assess that they're having the desired effect and then come back and ask what if, if and when he decides to ask for more, do so then. Now I've got a kind of a, a long arm question for you and it's, it's, it's a big one and it's a little outside yours. So if you feel uncomfortable completely answering it today, I hope you'd come back with your thoughts. Up until now, members of Congress have been saying we've got to put, and, and the administration, two administrations, been saying we have to put money in in order to free up mortgages. And I'm not dis dissuading anyone today from that view, but Another scenario, if we hadn't put a penny in to the back end, the banks, and instead we put a hypothetically sufficient amount, whatever it was, into the refinancing of new mortgages, so that if a bank said, look, I'm, I'm calling the loan, here's the foreclosure, because as you know, they're, they're not doing foreclosures right now in many cases. They're, people are staying in their homes months and months and months waiting to see what happens. If they'd done all the foreclosures and people who could make a monthly payment on a future mortgage had available mortgages, if we facilitated the front end of the new mortgage with trillions of dollars of, of capability, wouldn't we in some ways have marked to market, refinanced, found the good people, renegotiated in much less time than now where we're putting money in? The chairman and others have made the point that it doesn't necessarily seem to be trickling down. We're pushing it on this end, asking it to end up here, rather than saying, do what you think is right and we'll take care of people who are credit worthy, whether they are existing homeowners or future for homeowners on those foreclosed properties. The gentleman's time's expired, but I would ask uh, if you would answer his question. Uh, thank you. I, I think, uh, Congressman, I think we're doing both. So I think the actions taken to stabilize Fannie and Freddie to make sure that mortgages were still available and FHA is very important. I don't think we could just say, forget the banks, we're just gonna start up all new lending programs because we'd have no way of administering that. You know, the, the banks, for, for all our, our frustrations, they have thousands of branch offices in all of our communities and they are the tentacles out in to get credit out there. So I think we need to do both providing the government support for the lending, like the new program that I talked about, uh, as well as helping the banks get through this time. Thank you. Thank you. I, I thank the gentleman. You know, one of the, uh, we're going to go to a fourth uh, round with Mr. Kashgari. Uh, one of the things that I'm concerned about, uh, it, the Washington Post reports on a public-private partnership. They say the, uh, uh, last week the government is seeking to resuscitate the nation's crippled financial system by forging an alliance with the very outfits that most benefited from the bonanza preceding the collapse of the credit markets, hedge funds and private equity firms. Uh, the article goes on to say that they'd be invited to buy up recently issued highly rated securities. These securities finance consumer lending such as credit cards and student and auto loans. The program would involve the government lending nearly $1 trillion. Is this a public-private partnership you're talking about? Yes. Okay. So. Uh, in, in this uh, graph that the, uh, in, in some artwork that the Post puts out, they say that um, uh, with government assistance to stimulate purchases of the securities investors borrow from the Fed for $10 million worth, an investor might put up $1 million and borrow nine. And then it says the second part, the public part, the government offers to cover losses if consumers default and the asset-backed security declines in value. And it goes on to say that if the asset-backed security value falls, um, an investor may lose only his original $1 million, 
and the uh, Treasury and the Fed would absorb additional losses, which means that the exposure under this, according to this report, the exposure of uh, uh, the Treasury and the Fed could be as much as 90 percent. Um, now, here's my, here's my question. The Obama budget says that uh, he's put, he's put a, um, a marker, placeholder, of $250 billion, anticipating that would be the losses. Uh, if, uh, if the government goes forward with a $750 billion TARP II. Uh, we see uh, that uh, there is a, a discussion among uh, more money going to the FDIC. We know that the, that the amount of losses, according to the President's new budget, is 33 percent estimate. We know that the amount of loss that you've had before is around 30 percent. That's what the number that's being thrown, thrown about. Is it possible that if we go forward with a total of what could be about $3 trillion in TARP funds, rough figure, if the estimated loss would be 30 to 33 percent, we're looking at taxpayers being stuck with 900 to billion to a trillion dollars. Now, think about this. Every, you know, if, you, if you'd use three trillion dollars and you have, uh, somebody else could do the math here, but you have 300 million Americans, is, is that like $10,000 per capita? Is that like $30,000 or more a family that we're into this already? And then you get to this. Check this out. Today's headline, Washington Post. Rays of hope for big banks spur rally on Wall Street. Citigroup uh, apparently is doing some uh, recovery. Uh, and the article says, and this, is, this goes to what Mr. Kennedy raised and what I want to I laser focus on right now. Investors were being dealt more signs yesterday that corporations were shedding more jobs, seen by many as a way for companies to steady themselves during a deepening recession, United Technologies. A large industrial company said it expects to lay off 11,600 employees. AOL said it's executing a second major round of layoffs, shedding 10 percent of its workforce. I'm from Cleveland. Our economy has been falling apart. We've got foreclosures everywhere. The subprime loan bandits have capitalized in my city and crushed neighborhoods in my city. We're, our steel mills in trouble. We have auto plants that are in trouble. and and. The banks are doing, are, are starting to come back, according to this, but we don't see any evidence that we're going to come back. What, what can you tell the people in neighborhoods across this country that they should go ahead and put trillions of dollars of their money at risk when we're reading these reports that they could, that it looks like huge losses are in the offing under the best of circumstances? Why aren't we? taking a controlling interest in mortgage-backed securities and the government directing loan modifications instead of to, to lower principal, lower interest, instead of leaving it up to uh, people who are still freezing credit here in the States while they're shipping uh, jobs and money overseas. This, to me, is a textbook definition of, of political insanity. And I would just like, you know, do you ever think about these things? about the, the, the inherent contradictions that are in this, about how, you know, Wall Street might have one view of the world, but, uh, but the rest of America's uh, uh, just beset with all these problems as a result of Wall Street? Uh, thank you, Chairman. I think about these things all the time. And let me, you asked a, a very important but complex question, so please permit me to give a thorough answer to your question. First, let's talk about the foreclosure piece. You know, the administration has now come out with what I think is a very good loan modification program, a $75 billion program to encourage servicers and lenders to make long-term sustainable loan modifications. That program is getting up and running right now. We have teams of people reporting to me that are working on implementing that right now. We feel very good about that. I think that's going to make a, uh, an important difference in our com communities, number one. Number two, in terms of the loss estimates, I, I would like to offer uh, my perspective on that. I think we have to segment our different programs because different programs have different classes of risk for the taxpayers. So for example, the lending initiative that I've spent a lot of time talking about today, which Secretary Geithner wants to take to a trillion dollars, is secured by very high quality collateral. We expect where, where investors are in the first loss, 
actually there are multiple losses for investors before Treasury's exposed or the taxpayer is exposed. My expectation is the losses on that, on that pro program or the risks on that program are much, much lower than the risks in some of the other things that we've had to do. So I don't think it's, I'm just telling you candidly, I don't think we can take the loss estimate for one program and uh, scale it up and apply it. I don't think it's going to be uh, that, uh, that aggressive. Nonetheless, there are real risks. You know, we're all taxpayers, and none of us like putting our dollars at risk to have to do what we're having to do. But the economic consequences for all of us are much, much greater if we don't do these distasteful things that we're having to do, these putting taxpayer dollars at risk, intervening in these markets. We're having to do this. Uh, it's, un it's in our own interest. We need to get through this crisis as quickly as possible so the economy can grow again, so we can create jobs. And then we need to reform our regulatory system so we don't get back here again. Uh, my time's expired. I'd like to go to Mr. Souter. Uh, I want to I thank you for your time today, and I wanted to leave you with a couple thoughts. One encouraging thing is all these hearings, which I know have to be frustrated to you, it's amer amazing how much about finance Americans are going to be learning in this process, uh, what risks are. It's like we forgot what risk was. Uh, that in my house, I bought it from a, a local uh, small town bank, Grable Bank. Uh, next thing I knew, I was sending it to Brussels, uh, to Amro, Ambro, or whatever that company is. Now it goes to a company owned by the Chinese. Uh, if we're not careful here, we'll slam down our own mortgages on our, ourselves. This is this money is all over the place and split and securitized, and uh, much more complicated than most of us uh, even think about uh, when we get our uh, home mortgage, which may not even have the name of the company we're paying to. Right. Uh, that um, uh, the transparency question. Uh, one is, I, I know that some banks are nervous about getting in because they're worried that if they get this fund, they're going to uh, get a call from you or somebody that says, we noticed you put satellite radio in your car. Why did you do that? Uh, they're very concerned about the big hand of, of government here because they're watching the micromanaging. What's a fair salary? How do you do this? And what, uh, on the other hand, from the taxpayer perspective, you can hear today a lot of the frustration with transparency. And uh, I think uh, while you need to have your um, uh, private ability, and I'm very worried we're about in the process of potentially destroying private sector capital because of the amount of money that the government's going to be taking, how we're going to micromanage this, the different loan uh, categories. It's, it's a frightening thing. There might be public-private partnerships, but it's a scary time if you're a, more of a private sector person, partly brought on by the par private sector. But in the transparency question, um, I understand the point here, but even in mark-to-market, there's a deep suspicion that, that because the change only occurred in 07, that the reason we can't come back is, is that hedge fund, people who are buying short and long and all this kind of stuff have a chokehold on the system and it's not transparent. And that what would seem logical to a traditional banking system, we can't see what's happening. And that leads to a mistrust because it seems to a hardworking person who gets up in the morning and goes to work and starts a small business and tries to get expansion loan and then the bank calls down and says, we're not going to keep your revolving loan credit there. We're having struggles. Partly is somebody speculating against me and I can't see it. And so one of the advantages of the education process that we're going through is, is that it's also generated a fear that some people are manipulating this. And I think that the demand of transparency is going to overwhelm the desire to be uh, have flexibility in your decisions. Uh, when you touch the government, you get the full scale of the government. And this is very worrisome to many of us. At the same time, I don't know how to do it because even I don't have a lot of trust right now. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Cummings. Yeah, I, was, I was just sitting here thinking about what um, somebody watching this, whether the American people would, uh, how would they feel about all of this? The, this hearing, the newspapers are running story, by the way, just in case your staff hadn't told you, Cash Curry says that we should stay out of the bank's business of lending. That's, that's the story that's come out of this. That's what's all over the place. And um, then you've got AI Reuters that just came out with a story an hour ago. I just want to quote from this story. 
uh, it says six months after the United States government stepped in, stepped in and sa saved an insurance giant overwhelmed by derivative losses, AIG continues to bleed red ink. Its stocks and bondholders have been crushed, but one group has suffered almost no damage, banks that bought credit protection from AIG financial products. Regulatory filings show that since the Federal Reserve announced its rescue of AIG on September 15th, about $50 billion of government money has passed through the company to the banks. Treasury is providing a, quote, Treasury is providing a massive wealth transfer from taxpayers to Goldman Sachs and other parties, and it's something that absolutely should be investigated, said Eric Hovey. Hovde, Chief Executive of Hovde Capital Advisors, where he manages financial services focused on hedge funds. Um, and I think well, the reason why I mention that is it seems like the, the, the banks are coming out of this pretty good. They're getting money, whether they want it or not. They get it. If they don't like your rules, you know what they say? Screw you. We'll give it back. Then we've got you saying we shouldn't meddle in their business. Taxpayers are saying we just want a loan. Then you tell us that you, and, and, and I'm, I'm sure this is, is, important, is, is a good thing, this uh, entity that you're creating to help people get loans and auto loans and, and all of that. But the problem is this. It seems as if we're going, it's, 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 I mean, it seems that we are helping the banks tremendously, but they basically, I mean, and they could be more of a part of the solution to the problem, but I kind of think maybe, whether it's intentional or un unintentional, that we just said to them, you go guys, we're going to keep on giving you the money and you do whatever you want because the top guy says Congress don't, don't, we, we shouldn't be trying to determine who they lend to. They are the decision makers. As President Bush said, the deciders. And the deciders have gotten us into the jam that we're in today. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that I want to go back to that analogy that I gave. You, I, I believe that you all are doing everything in your power. I believe that you lose sleep. I think you're giving it everything, and I think you're very, very competent. I think the whole team is. But I feel like you're going up a hill, but, but, but it's not becoming any easier when, when, the, Bush, the, the, when the, the banks could help us up this hill by having some gravel down there so we could get something so that we get a, a grip on or something, we get ice. And I don't know whether it's, I, I, sometimes I, I think that the folks on Wall Street operate on a, in a whole different world. I don't know if they even have a clue, a clue about the people who are looking at this right now. I really don't. It's like, you know, when, I, when they say a million dollars, it's like $25 to the folks who are losing their homes. And so I gotta, I gotta, you gotta say something to me. You gotta do something for me to tell these banks to, to, to help out. I mean, I don't want, I don't want this hearing, I don't want us to leave this hearing with them saying, thanks. Now we've really got our way. And, it, and it's very, very painful. Uh, you may uh, respond to Mr. Cummings uh, and then we'll, we'll conclude this round. Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman. I share your frustration. Every time I open the paper and I read another story of some shindig somewhere, I just wonder, what are these guys thinking? They're not helping themselves. They're not helping me. They're not helping the Washington or the people, you know, our leaders who are trying to get us through this. They're not helping the American people have confidence. And so I think that there have been many cases of enormous lapses of judgment in some of the actions that the banks have taken. And I also, sir, I don't want to leave you with the wrong impression. 
my comments about we don't want to micromanage these institutions. I'm talking about the hundreds, maybe thousands of institutions we're investing in, community banks all around our country who did not create this problem. But we want to encourage them to participate because they're in the best position to step up and increase credit. So that's where my, my comments were directed there. For the institutions, the one-offs that made terrible decisions and they need extraordinary assistance from the federal government to prevent them from being destabilized, then we absolutely have obligations and responsibilities to make sure that they run their businesses in a prudent and sound manner and that they can pay back the taxpayers. Again, my two highest priorities are financial stability and paying back the taxpayers. Thank you. I, I thank the gentleman. Um, Mr. Piaschgeri, you've uh, been here for four rounds of questioning. Uh, we're going to conclude uh, uh, the questioning of, of you. And uh, thank you for giving this committee your time here and giving uh, this country your service. Uh, we know this hasn't been easy for you as a witness, uh, but I think that you've been a good witness in representing uh, the point of view that Treasury has been conducting as policy the uh, difference that we have is, you know, that we have to, this whole hearing has been about challenging the policies, about uh, what we believe is Treasury's failure to monitor the ways in which financial institutions are using taxpayers' funds. And, and I think that, you know, as I c uh, conclude and, uh, you know, send you w with the uh, appreciation of this committee, I, I, one of the things I've seen here, and Mr. Souter uh, brings it up, uh, you know, there, there is a fundamental flaw in government intervention in the markets. I mean, this is, uh, we're, this is why we're here. Uh, the um, um, government's intervening in markets, and it's picking winners and losers. Um, so when the issue came up about micromanaging, uh, you have to remember that Congress has a constitutional obligation for oversight. We're a co-equal branch of government, and uh, we cannot defer to, to Treasury when, when there are trillions of tax dollars at stake. I know, I know you understand that, which is the whole point of this hearing, and that uh, the reason why we're here in the first place is that uh, the banks did not perform their fiduciary responsibilities. So when we want to defer to the banks again, you could understand why we'd have some problems with just letting that go unchallenged and in uh, not insisting that Treasury, as we move forward, has to look at their responsibilities for monitoring the ways in which financial institutions are, are, um, are using these tax fair funds under the Troubled Asset Relief Program. So with that, I just want to say that you've appeared before this subcommittee on two occasions. Uh, you have conducted yourself in a way that I, th I think reflects honor uh, and service to the country, and I want to thank you for your presence here and all, all the members of this committee who I've talked to uh, about your presence here today. While we may take issue with your presentation, uh, we think that you have certainly been an excellent witness for the Department of Treasury. So thank you, Mr. Kashkari. Uh, we are going to uh, proceed. Uh, the first panel is now, uh, with Mr. Kashkari, is now discharged, and uh, we're going to take a five-minute recess, and it's only five minutes, as we get the second panel together, and we're going to combine the second panel and the third panel together without objection, but we're going to take a five-minute recess. Uh, we'll be back in five minutes.
Well, we're fortunate to have an outstanding group of witnesses on our second panel. And uh, if you joined us, we're combining the first and the second panel. Uh, this is the Domestic Policy Subcommittee of Oversight and Government and Reform. The topic for today is peeling back the tarp, exposing Treasury's failure to monitor the ways financial institutions are using taxpayer funds provided under the Troubled Asset Relief Program. Our first panel has been with uh, Mr. Neil Kashkari, and we're going to go to the uh, second panel. And uh, moving, moving right into this, I want to introduce the members of the panel. Uh, they include Professor Anthony B. Sanders, Professor of Finance and Real Estate at the W.P. Carey College of Business of Arizona State University, where he holds the Bob Herberger Arizona Heritage Chair. He's previously taught at the University of Chicago, the Graduate School of Business, University of Texas at Austin, Macomb School of Business, and the Ohio State University Fisher College of Business. In addition, he served as director and head of asset backed and mortgage backed securities research at Deutsche Bank in New York City. Mr. Stephen Horn is vice president of master data management and integration services for Dow Jones Business and Relationship Intelligence. Mr. Horn has over 30 years' experience in master data management, consumer relationship management, web data applications, and very large database development. Mr. Horn specializes in large-scale data integration and data utilization from the Dow Jones Master Database and performs business development and strategy for these areas. Previously, Mr. Horn was a consultant for Generate, a startup relationship mapping and uh, web-based data collection firm that was acquired by Dow Jones to become the Dow Jones BRI division. Mr. Mark Boyano, is that, uh, is that the correct pronunciation? Va bene. Is president and CEO of XBRL US Incorporated, the leading advocate for the use of extensible business reporting language which promises to increase the transparency of reporting and disclosure of corporate financial information. Mr. Boyano joined XBRL US as its first president and CEO in December of 2006. Previously, he led the technology and online communications operation of the Council on Foundations as vice president and chief financial officer. We're also joined by Mr. Neil Borofsky. Mr. Borofsky was confirmed by the Senate as a special inspector general for the TARP on December uh, 8, 2008, and was sworn into office on December 15, 2008. Prior to assuming the position of special inspector general, Mr. Borofsky was a federal prosecutor in the United States Attorney's Office for Southern District of New York for more than eight years. In that office, Mr. Borofsky was a senior trial counsel who headed the Mortgage Fraud Group, which uh, investigated and prosecuted all aspects of mortgage fraud, from retail mortgage fraud cases to investigations involving potential securities fraud which res with respect to collateralized debt obligations. Mr. Borofsky received the Attorney, Gen the Attorney General's John Marshall Award for his work on the case that led to the conviction of former president of REFCO, Inc., and that's uh, Tony Grant, and the guilty plea of Philip Bennett, uh, REFCO's former chief executive officer. Mr. Uh, Richard Hillman has served 31 years with the U.S. Government Accountability Office and is currently the managing director of the GAO's financial markets and community investment team. This team helps the Congress improve the efficiency of regulatory oversight in financial and housing markets and the management of community development programs. Over the past decade, Mr. Hillman has produced scores of reports and led a wide variety of efforts assessing the economy, efficiency, and effectiveness of federal and state regulation of financial services sector. Is the policy of the Committee of Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify? Uh, I, I want to thank all of you for being here, and I ask that now you would rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole <coughs> truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. You may be seated. Let the record reflect that each of the witnesses has answered in the affirmative. 
As with panel one and two, I ask that each witness give an oral summary of his or her testimony. And I would especially ask that you keep this summary under five minutes in duration. I would like you to bear in mind that your complete written statement will be included in the hearing record. And uh, we're going to, um, uh, excuse me one minute. Did you Uh, we're going to go from uh, my left to right. Uh, we're going to start with Professor Saunders. Uh, you have uh, five minutes, and I think we'll cover some of the territory in the Q&A. So you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, uh, thank you for the invitation to testify before you today. I testified before you on November 14, 2008, on the subject of the Troubled Asset Relief Program, TARP. At that time, we understood that the Treasury had not purchased any loans from the financial institutions using TARP funds. Instead, the TARP funds were deployed to numerous financial institutions. My testimony today focuses on the lack of transparency surrounding the use of the TARP funds and uh, as well as some related uh, Treasury and uh, Federal Reserve programs. Transparency is of critical importance to the stability of financial markets as well as the reputation of the U.S. and the international economy. For example, research has found that the frequency of stock market crashes is higher in countries with companies that are more opaque or less transparent to outside investors. A recent paper on asset mortgage securitization side <coughs> has concluded that in order to attract investors, transparency is essential. The less transparent a market is, the more poorly understood it will be by investors, and the higher will be the yield to those investors that to demand for the uh, compensate for the uncertainty. Thus, whether we are talking about loans that are originated and securitized by banks or how TARP funds are deployed to the banks, transparency is critical to returning trust to our financial system and comforting investors, both U.S. and globally. When we consider that our own federal government borrows funds from overseas investors, Transparency would be a vital tool in restoring confidence in the tarnished financial system of the United States. Greater transparency of the TARP can alleviate concern amongst U.S. taxpayers about the, and, and the investment community that the funds are being used appropriately and not wasted. Without tran transparency, we are no longer the shining city on the hill. Rather, we are New York City during the blackout of 1977. For example, there should be more transparent asset valuation that we understand how Treasury and the Federal Reserve are valuing the banks relative to the private market valuations, that is the stock market. If the Treasury systematically is overvaluing the banks, it is an indication that we are still in danger from toxic assets, particularly mortgage, that have not been dealt with. Until asset valuation is more transparent and the market is confident that banks have written down toxic assets, such as bad mortgage loans, and accurately price these assets, any effort to restore stability and confidence in our financial system will ultimately fail. Now, one can argue that all assets, including TARP funds, are fungible, meaning that it is very difficult, if not impossible, to trace how TARP funds are spent. For example, if Bank A receives $15 billion in TARP funding, but is so large and complex that a paper trail cannot be followed, that presents serious problems. Despite our accounting and regulatory reporting on these institutions, the TARP funds seemingly sank into an abyss or a black hole. Clearly, greater transparency is required so that the TARP funds are spent in a non-wasteful manner. Now, currently, financial institutions report that uh, information that can be found in SEC filings, the 10Ks and Qs, and call reports that are produced quarterly. However, this information is not real time and is highly aggregated. As a consequence, it is difficult to follow the money from these filings. Although banks can report on the use of TARP funds in a timelier fashion with Treasury, even daily, uh, the quality of these reports may be of dubious substance given the size and complexity of the financial institutions that have received TARP funds. For example, our largest financial institutions have hundreds of divisions and subsidiaries and perform operations in numerous countries. For example, Citigroup has operations in over 100 countries uh, and includes such banks as Bonamex. For regulatory body, Congress, the executive branch, and financial institutions themselves to understand where the TARP funds have gone, there is a need for more aggressive forms of auditing that prevent better disclosure. Traditional auditing of the financial institutions is a time-consuming and labor-intensive process. The Office of the Special Inspector General for the Troubled Asset Relief Program, SIGTARP, produced an initial report to the U.S. Congress on February 6, 2009, detailing the allocation of TARP funds, which is an admirable first step in providing transparency for the TARP program, but it does not address how the recipients of the TARP funds have actually spent the money. 
an approach that can offer real-time measures of the expenditure of the TARP funds or any other uh, allocation of government funds as volumetrics. It is possible to obtain vast amount of reported information on loans, corporate benefits, golf tournaments, concerts, retreats, and aggregate them into a usable form for regulators and other market participants. Now, should the taxpayers be concerned about a particular bank using TARP funds for naming of a sports stadium? While it can be argued that naming of a sports stadium or a professional golf tournament is part of a marketing strategy, but it can also be argued that the price of, that the bank pays for these naming rights is far in excess of their advertising value. While it may be a reasonable argument to name sports stadiums, these institutions must be aware of the backlash by taxpayers and regulators against perceived squandering of scarce taxpayer dollars in an economic crisis. The same argument applies to rock concerts, corporate events, executive compensation, and perquisites. I'd, I'd like to ask the gentleman uh, if he could uh, try to wrap up uh, his testimony, and I know we'll get back to you in the Q&A. Transparency for the use of TARP fund recipients represents a step towards how we understand how tax dollars are deployed, particularly in an economic climate. In summary, the TARP should be wrapped in saran wrap rather than a lead veil that Superman can't even penetrate. Taxpayers have the right to know what to be done with their wealth, and transparency helps achieve more economically sound use of TARP funds and eliminate waste. Thank you for letting me share my thoughts with you. Uh, saran wrap. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Boyano. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. The Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. It's my privilege to testify today about XBRL, or Extensible Business Reporting Language. I am here as the president of a nonprofit organization, XBRL US, that advances XBRL as an open, free, open source standard. We all benefit from internet standards, and I'm not going to take any time to try to explain the concept just in the way that the web standard brought us browsers and global access and search to a huge amount of information. Or PDF gave us high fidelity to the print document, or even emails made it possible for any of us to exchange messages, regardless of what software, what device, or even where we are. XBRL simply makes a common dictionary available and a consistent structure so that all financial reports can use a common format, so that it can be shared and exchanged at much lower cost with much lower time to do the processing. As we've heard for the last few hours, it is very labor and time intensive to analyze and parse financial reports. XBRL documents are more consistent and they're searchable and they're machine readable. And it can transform a 1,500-page 10K annual report that's nothing but a, a long stream of text into a structured index document that can be readily processed. But it's not the technology plumbing and wiring that's really the issue here. What's important about this standard and any standard is that the world chooses to agree on it. And the world has agreed on XBRL as the standard across the world for business reporting. I'd like to take just the next few minutes to elaborate on this and refer to my testimony in more detail to make the points that XBRL is real, it's ready, and it's relevant to the discussion of the subcommittee today. First of all, it's real. Every quarter, 8,000 banks report to the FDIC using this format, and they have since 2005. Um, I'll Re again, refer to the testimony on the, on the efficiencies of oversight and regulation gained by the <coughs> FDIC by using XBRL. A hundred companies today voluntarily file to the SEC their financial reports using XBRL. And over the next two years, SEC rules will phase in. All publicly traded companies will submit their financial reports, including the industrial, uh, industrial disclosures and footnotes that have numbers embedded in narrative text, like the pension footnote in XBRL, all, all mutual funds, uh, all credit ra rating agencies will be filing to the SEC, phased in. These rules have just been promulgated and they'll be phased in over the next two years. So XBRL is real. It's in production. The dictionary that the SEC uses 
uh, developed by our nonprofit by bringing together um, lots of industries and professions for the common good, contains every concept in US GAAP, generally accepted accounting practices. Uh, and we're building on that uh, in, to include, uh, as uh, detailed in the testimony, mortgage-backed securities. This, this is uh, ready for use, in the, and it's being applied right now in our uh, market. It's also ready in terms of having a strong organizational underpinnings. Our nonprofit is, uh, brings together the accounting industries, the CFOs that issue, all the way to the investors and the, everyone in between, including technology companies, for the common good to make sure that we get a high quality agreement uh, between industry and government to, uh, to publish out these dictionaries. And finally, I'm going to say it's relevant in that um, again and again uh, we heard today about we're not sure, we can't see, we don't know. The fact is you can't provide oversight to something you can't see. And this common standard does offer a powerful tool for the government and for markets to get true visibility and transparency into the facts, into the books. With that, I'll uh, conclude my remarks. And I, again, I thank you. Um, I'll, I'll just end with, with the one point that um, transparency is no longer a matter of technical capability. It's a decision that's waiting to be made. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, subcommittee. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Boyano. Uh, Mr. Horn, you may proceed. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Jordan, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Steve Horn, and I want to thank you for inviting us here to speak to you today. I'm going to show you an example of what uh, Professor Sanders and Mr. Bolgiano were just speaking of. Um, and the question is getting to uh, TARP transparency, and I've got uh, some slides up on the uh, board. You may not be able to see them too well. Those who have the handouts have the slides included. Um, the question you've raised is where did the money go? Um, and I think that's the question everybody's been asking since this, this morning started. Um, I'm going to show you how to take what is complex financial information and make it simple and then transparent. And I'm showing on the slide here eight of the CPP institutions. I, I intentionally left off AIG because being an SFFI, SSFI, they have different things that we have to look at, and we can talk about those at another time if you wish. Um, but these companies collectively received uh, just about tw $200 billion of the total TARP outlay from Tranche 1. Um, they collectively represent over $10 trillion in assets. They have greater than 14,000 subsidiaries, any of which could receive funds that have been infused into the institutions themselves. They have greater than 6,000 executives making decisions as to how to use these corporate assets. And in the first 100 days since TARP funds were approved, there's been greater than 40,000 what we call public events, which consist of regulatory filings, press releases, and other kinds of public disclosure about these firms regarding TARP, specifically TARP. Now, let's look at an institution to illustrate the complexity, okay? I don't expect anybody to read this art eye chart, okay? Rather, I'm making a point of the structural complexity, in this case of just Bank of America. And, and I chose Bank of America because they were alphabetical. So there's any other institution is going to kind of look this way. Um, this is a portion, and only a portion, of B of A's 2,435 subsidiaries and divisions. Uh, the reporting banks on the slide are shown in red. The investment firms are shown in blue. Any of these subsidiaries and divisions may be a beneficiary of the funds that are part of the total $45 billion in total capital infusions that have come into this institution through TARP uh, to Bank of America. 104 of these subsidiaries and divisions file with up to 20 or more government agencies, and there's no single holistic view of the institution that come in through those agencies. Furthermore, the information sometimes come in disparate and incompatible formats. And my friend here, Mr. Bolgiano, has commented on the fact that we are very big subscribers to the concept of XBRL um, because that is a compatible and uh, consistent format. In other cases, it's aggregated at the holding company level, but you lose all the detail of the transactions that are underneath it. Okay? Now, a lens can be put on individual transactions that roll the data into a single view of the institution. Okay? Now, in the timeline that's shown on my chart here, um, you, instead of looking at greater than 10,000 the Bank of America events, a regulator could highlight what they might call the seminal events chosen by them 
which show the key transactions of the funds that move through the institution. In addition, the aggregation of the non-public regulatory data as proposed under Congresswoman Maloney's bill, uh, TARP Accountability and Disclosure Act, would be available to the regulator as well. At the request of the committee, we have a sample of transactions that are in excess of $1 billion, as well as charitable contributions and marketing events during this first 100-day period. The first capital infusion at the beginning of the chart took place on October 28th of last year, and $15 billion were taken onto the Bank of America books as a partial receivable. The remaining $10 billion was paid out when the Merrill Lynch transaction was completed. Other events, including the issuance of new debt, to layoffs, to charitable contributions, continue to impact the balance sheet as highlighted in this timeline. So let's drill into one of these events, okay? Just last week, the Bank of America filed their 10K SEC annual report for 2008. Now, here on the right side of the chart, um, what you're going to see is a statement about their new Q4 lending activity. And other institutions have made similar types of statements. Now, to use an analogy, think of your own checking account. You know your balance. You just can't look at the deposits. You have to look at the withdrawals, too. So to add transparency, must, one must look at the offsetting activities shown in the summary, including write-downs, foreclosures, toxic asset reductions, et cetera, to get to the balance as you would in your own checking account. You might question, you know, the lending activity is occurring between the banking institutions and federally sanctioned lending institutions such as Freddie, May, Freddie Mac, Freddie May, FHA, et cetera. And so none of this is contained within the filings themselves. Now compare the single institution to looking at three separate and aggregated view of three separate institutions, in this case, uh, Bank of America, Citigroup, and J.P. Morgan Chase. These banks were recipients of more than 75 billions during the Q4 period of 2008 of TARP funds that were reported increased lending activity. Similar offsets took place with these institutions as well. What we see here is 75 billion in capital fusions and less than 100 billion, or 100 million rather, in increased net credit facilities to the American people. Now that's what's on the balance sheet. What's off the balance sheet is another thing entirely, but that means it's not transparent. How do we reconcile the overall lending activity from the institutions are reporting to the federal government? Public data plus the addition of the data including Congressman Maloney's bill will enable the ultimate provider of information to go from a complex collection of separate transactions across thousands of organizations to greater transparencies of funds distributed to the government to private institutions. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Jordan, members of the committee for your time and attention. Uh, you've given us a lot to think about here, and uh, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. Uh, Mr. Borofsky, uh, Special Inspector General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Kucinich, Ranking Member Jordan, members of the subcommittee, I'm honored to appear before you today as the Special Inspector General for the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or as we call it, SIGTARP. Um, $300 billion has already gone out the door and including the recently announced programs, Treasury intends to combine TARP funds with the Federal Reserve and others to more than quadruple the original $700 billion allotment to fund at least eight separate programs involving approximately $2.9 trillion. These huge investments of taxpayer money will invariably create opportunities for waste, fraud, and abuse and will require strict oversight. To meet this oversight challenge, I have focused SIGTARP on three areas since our inception. Enforcement, transparency, and oversight. First, enforcement. Of the four primary bodies set forth in the Stabilization Act, we alone are responsible for investigating those who seek to criminally profit from the TARP. To meet this challenge, we have developed key relationships with other law enforcement and prosecutorial agencies from coast to coast, and have already shut down one securities fraud in Tennessee and of several other criminal investigations pending. Today, I'm also pleased to announce our newly formed TALF Task Force. The TALF has been announced as a trillion-dollar Federal Reserve Bank of New York um, program that will be seeded with up to $100 billion in TARP money. It is intended to restore liquidity into the securitization market by lending government money to investors, including hedge funds, to buy newly issued asset-backed securities. We have been vocal in our warnings about the susceptibility of this program to fraud, and today we convert those warnings into action by putting together a team of federal law enforcement and regulatory investigators to address potential fraud in the TALF. Members of this task force will include the SEC, the FBI, the Postal Inspection Service, ICE, Treasury's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, the Fed Federal Reserve's Inspector General, and the IRS. We will operate out of New York and Washington and provide training to both federal and local law enforcement and prosecutorial agencies 
and provide a conduit so we can ensure quick response to any tip or lead, whether generated from our hotline, 877-SIG-2009, the Federal Reserve, or elsewhere. Together, the members of our task force will combine our shared experience in securities fraud investigations and combine our resources to identify and cut off potential fraud schemes before they can fully develop, deter would-be criminals, and bring to justice those who seek to commit fraud through the TAL. For any would-be fraudster, our message is clear. If you try and steal from this program, we will fine you, we will investigate you, and we will put you in jail. My office has also focused on transparency since my first day in the office. And our audits are going to bring transparency both to those running the TARP program and the TARP recipients. We're conducting a survey of the TARP's recipients' use of funds and on both the recipients' plans for complying with executive compensation conditions as well as Treasury's plans on overseeing compliance. We're also conducting audits on the impact of outside influences, such as lobbyists, on the TARP application process, and a case study on the circumstances under which Bank of America received approval for $45 billion in cash, $100 billion in asset guarantee in four different transactions through three separate TARP programs. As for oversight, we have and will continue to coordinate our oversight activities with my co-panelist, Rick Hillman, and his colleagues at GAO, as well as with the other inspectors general whose responsibilities touch on the TARP. We've also tried to have a positive impact on TARP programs before the money goes out the door. Treasury has adopted several of our recommendations, and we'll continue to make recommendations to Treasury to address potential fraud as the new programs are rolled out. The TARP program has changed significantly since the Stabilization Act was passed last October. Originally intended to purchase and manage $700 billion of toxic assets, that effort now stands as just a portion of only one of the eight intended TARP programs and less than 25 percent of the total $2.9 trillion involved. We must change with it, and I ask that you support S-383, the Special Inspector General Act of 2009 which unanimously passed the Senate early last month and would give my office important hiring flexibility to react as the TARP programs grow and evolve. Quick passage of this important and essential legislation will help me continue to build the necessary core of my office to meet this challenge. Chairman Kucinich, Ranking Member Jordan, members of the committee, I commend you for your efforts to ensure proper oversight of the trillions of dollars of American taxpayer funds, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Borofsky. Uh, Mr. Hillman is the uh, person who is the Managing Director of Financial Markets and Community Investment for the United States Government Accountability Office. Thank you for being here. You may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss our work on the Troubled Assets Relief Program. My statement today is primarily based on our second 60-day report required under ESA that was issued on January 30, 2009. Specifically, my statement focuses on the nature and purpose of activities that have been initiated under TARP and Treasury's efforts to establish a management structure for TARP. Regarding our first objective, Treasury has announced a number of new programs to try to stabilize financial markets, but most of its activities during our reporting period have continued to fall under its capital purchase program. As of March 5, 2009, Treasury has dispersed approximately $300 billion in TARP funds about $200 billion of which was for the Capital Purchase Program. Our previous report emphasized the lack of monitoring and reporting for program investments and recommended stronger measures to ensure that participating institutions use the funds to meet the program's purpose and comply with program requirements on, for example, executive compensation and dividend payments. In response to our recommendation, Treasury developed plans to survey the largest 20 institutions monthly to monitor lending and other activity and analyze quarterly call report data for all institutions. While the monthly survey is a step toward greater transparency and accountability for the largest institutions, we continue to believe that additional action is needed to better ensure that all participating institutions are accountable for their use of program funds. Our latest report recommended that Treasury expand the scope of its monthly surveys to include collecting at least some information from all institutions participating in the program. Further, our most recent report found that Treasury has made limited progress in articulating and communicating an overall strategy for TARP. This lack of a clearly articulated vision has complicated Treasury's ability to effectively communicate with Congress, the financial markets, and the public on the benefits of TARP and has limited its ability to identify personnel needs. 
while Treasury has continued to publicly report on individual issues, testify, and make speeches about the program, it continues to struggle to convey a clearly articulated and overarching message about its efforts potentially hampering TARP's effect effectiveness and underscoring ongoing questions about its communications strategy. Without a clearly articulated strategic vision, Treasury's effectiveness in helping to stabilize markets may be hampered. Our most recent report recommended that Treasury clearly articulate its vision for TARP and to document needed skills and competencies to achieve that vision. Regarding our second objective on TARP's efforts to establish a management structure for TARP, our first report included several recommendations for Treasury to improve hiring, contract oversight, and its system of internal controls. Treasury has taken important steps to address our recommendations, but in its latest report, we found that it still faces several challenges. First, it took proactive steps to ensure a smooth transition to the new administration by keeping positions filled and using an expedited hiring process, including direct hire authority. Moreover, after losing some potential candidates because of conflicts of interest, Treasury is now asking candidates to address potential conflicts earlier in the recruitment process to avoid unnecessary delays in finalizing employment offers. However, it continues to face difficulty pro providing competitive salaries to attract skilled employees. Second, consistent with our earlier report about contracting oversight, Treasury has enhanced such oversight by tracking cost, schedule, and performance, and addressing its training requirements of personnel who oversee the contracts. However, as we previously recommended, Treasury needs to continue to identify and mitigate conflicts of interest in contracting. Similarly, in an earlier recommendation, our latest report found that a framework for adopting and organizing the development and implementation of a system for internal controls for TARP activities is progressing. The plan, the program plans to use this framework to develop specific standards, policies, drive communications on expectations, and measure effectiveness of internal controls and, pol and the related policies and procedures. However, to date, much work continues to be needed to be accomplished in this area, including implementing a disciplined risk assessment process. Our latest report called for the development of a comprehensive system of internal controls over TARP activities, including detailed policies and procedures and guidance that are robust enough to ensure that the program's objectives and requirements are being met. In summary, Treasury is taking important steps to implement our previous recommendations, but we continue to identify a number of areas that warrant ongoing action by Treasury to improve the accountability and integrity of the program. Mr. Chairman and Mr. the Subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss these critically important issues and be happy to address any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Hellman. I'd like to go to questions now and begin with Mr. Horn. In your testimony, you made the pretty shocking statement that the new lending uh, several of the largest TARP recipients have claimed they're doing has been grossly overstated. Uh, I'm going uh, to ask staff to uh, help us with some of these uh, Bank of America slides. How could their representations be so far at odds with your own? Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't believe that the representations per se are at odds. What they are are uh, one side of the story. Um, you well, have you're just looking at new credit, but not offset by credit contracted. If you're going to publish a story that says that you're giving uh, 115 billion or whatever, uh, 150 billion in case of another institution, et cetera, that talks about new lending activities, um, the balance sheet would actually say to you that you should also show the opposite side of those transactions. Um, that has not been what we have observed. Um, and again, so we don't really have a clear view as to the net effect. Transparency would, would dictate that you would want both sides of the, of so the picture. You, so you could have a condition where a lot of money is going out the door, but the credit contracts and you have a net loss. Well, again, as I am said, we're trying to represent information from a transparency I, I know you, standpoint. Right. So, so our issue is, from a transparency perspective, if you want to be transparent, um, and we've been doing so for 100 years for the commercial marketplace, um, you have to show both sides of the, of the picture. Okay. And it's impossible for you to say that you're giving out lending without having an offsetting amount that shows what you're retracting. Thank you, Mr. Horn. I want to ask Professor Sanders, from the standpoint of impact on the economy, 
Which is a more accurate description of bank lending activities, the method of representation employed by several TARP recipients or the method that Mr. Horn has presented? Well, I think the method Mr. Horn is presenting gives us a much better picture of how it's really impacting our economy and how it's impacting borrowers. Because again, the, the way the, the bank balance sheets are structured and the call reports, we just can't get a good picture. Uh, what Mr. Horn's talking about is much more in real time and is much more uh, translucent. We can actually see what's going on. So let's go back to Mr. Horn. If the banks you've identified are creating so little new credit now that they have billions in TARP funds, what are they using TARP funds for? Well, again, m most of the activity that we're seeing from a transparency perspective are reflected in the balance sheet. So if you looked along the timeline of some of the, the examples of events, you can see some of the examples of events. The first transaction that took place in the case of the Bank of America event was a $16.8 billion debt buy-down on Countrywide uh, being infused into Bank of America. Now, at that point in time, they only received $15 billion, so they used some of their internal funds. They also, many of the institutions need money to make money. In other words, you can't go out and make, lend secured notes or create senior debt without having balances or, or, or relatively large sums in reserves. So they want to keep this money on their books in some cases in order to be able to try to get other institutions to invest in them. Well, can I get a true picture, a Treasury uh, a bank lending by relying on the monthly intermediation? No, you snapshot? cannot. You need to have every, every individual event that occurs transactionally um, over time brought together into a single format and structure so to answer that question. So all the necessary information is available to regulators to create transparency of how tr TARP funds are being used? All the necessary information is available in 25 or some odd different places. Mr. Mr. Boyano, uh, Treasury can track how banks are, are using these funds? Yes. And uh, the technical capability is there, is that right? Yes. That's correct. So it comes to the question of whether there's a will to do it. That's right. Uh, some have argued that since TARP funds are fungible, is it not possible to track the use of TARP funds? I mean, Mr. Horn? Um, it's absolutely possible. Uh, Professor Sanders uh, mentioned volumetrics. Um, volumetrics is if you think of two glasses of water, and if you were to pour the water, they were both half full, and you pour the water out of one glass, and as long as you don't spill any into another glass, um, you should have the same volume of water. If you look at individual events, and remember there's a Pareto principle. I don't know how many are familiar with the 80-20 Pareto law. law. Well, in these cases of the institutions that we're talking about here, it's more like 95-5, where 5% of the transactions make up 95% of the actual movement of funds. So there's not, as a proportion of number of transactions, a large number volumetrically of funds that have to be looked at in order to understand the ebbs and flows of the funds moving throughout the business. Okay, it is complex in terms of the interconnections, and that's why it's so important to have a format such as XBRL, which would leave the ability to take two different systems together that are speaking totally different languages and bring them together as one. Thank you, uh, Mr. Horn. Uh, uh, my uh, time has concluded uh, this round. Mr. Jordan, you may proceed for Thank five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Minutes. Chairman. Uh, is, is it fair to say then, uh, I'm, I'm trying to gather this together, that it's almost too much information in too many different forms is actually leading to a lack of transparency. Is that the problem? And we'll go with Mr. Horn again. Um, yes, Ranking Mer Member Jordan. Uh, in some cases, that is true. But I feel that it's mostly a lack of the ability for individual members of various committees, of the regulatory agencies, et cetera, to read paper documents. We live in Washington in a document-based world. We don't okay. live in a data world. Is, has there been a reluctance on the part of uh, various financial institutions and, uh, and or the Treasury to embrace Mr. Boyano's um, uh, XBRL that he talked about or, or, or the, the process that's going to allow us to sort of synthesize this and, and get it in a readable form? Has there been a reluctance out there to go that direction? Well, I would defer that to Mr. Boyano right. relative to his. Well, uh, in our markets today, there's uh, – and if there's been a reluctance, give me your why. Why, why I, is I that the case? I think there is certainly a reluctance, first of all, to change in general. But also, uh, information is a very valuable commodity. And the absence of a standard and the absence of transparency makes the processing and the publishing of that information a very profitable enterprise. Valuable, sure. 
This is, this is a commodity right. that flows through our, our economy just like any other. Um, so that the absence of transparency does protect certain businesses. Mr. Uh, I want to go to, to, the, to the Inspector General. Mr. Borofsky, your thoughts on the same question? We obviously, we've initiated, we've taken a different approach to this. We made a recommendation to Treasury that they require banks to um, establish internal controls to account for their use of funds and report on their use of funds. We recommended that they do that on a forward going basis. They haven't, so we've initiated our own use of funds survey. And we've polled all of the banks. And wait, wait, go, go back. I'm, I'm going to just reset that you made a recommendation to Treasury to, d to, to increase transparency, and they didn't? Yes, it's included in our, our February 6 report. We made a okay. recommendation that for every agreement going forward, um, just taking a step back, we initially made the recommendation back in late December. And they did adopt it with respect to Bank America and Citigroup in those, the, those extraordinary transactions. They did require those banks to establish internal controls at our recommendation and to report quarterly on how they're using the funds. They've not adopted that recommendation with respect to any other financial institutions. And, and give me your uh, guess as to why. I don't want to. I don't want to hazard a guess. Um, I think that Mr. Kashkari had has articulated some things this morning that are probably consistent with that explanation. I don't want to speak for him, mm -hmm. but concern about putting certain conditions on. Well, I mean, that's an, obviously that's an important question, particularly when, uh, in your written testimony, you talk about the potential exposure of hundreds of billions of dollars in taxpayer money uh, potentially being lost to fraud, and that's in your written testimony. So that's an important question. It's absolutely an important question. And, and, and um, talk about the relation, your thoughts on the XBRL, the, 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 that, that concept as well. Well, we have, which, from our perspective, we're, we're taking a look and we're doing the survey of all the financial institutions' use of funds, and we're going to mm -hmm. get their, their narratives. Uh, they're coming in. I think we have about 90 percent responded. I think XBRL would help us turn around and then test some of these responses, but we're taking a different approach really on starting with the financial institutions' own reporting on how they're using the funds. Now, our reports also require certification uh, subject to criminal penalty that if they lie to us, they'd be committing a crime and we would investigate that. So we're hoping that provides a sufficient hammer to make sure we get accurate responses. It's, it's usually a pretty good incentive. Uh, l last question, um, XBRL, can this help us, and my, my guess is it can, um, get to the question that I posed earlier to Mr. Kashkari that, you know, we still haven't got at the, the, the focus of this entire TARP program initially, the mortgage-backed securities. Can it help us in that regard as well? That's your signal. Uh, yes, Mr. Jordan, we've been working on uh, the mortgage-backed Securities Dictionary for the last six months with this, with this question in mind. Uh, it's not a substitute for policy, obviously, and it's not a substitute for access to the information uh, or the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the government authority to request that information. But it does give a consistent mm -hmm. vehicle for that information to be delivered and for the government to use it effectively. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I thank the gentleman, Mr. Cummings, five minutes. The, uh, Mr. Broski, you mentioned the, I think you were talking about the task force. Um, and then you just talked a moment ago about um, if folks lie to you. What kind of, uh, how, do you, how do you deal with that? And what is the, what, what's the offense? Well, any, any, lie, any, any official, senior executive officer, any person, who lies to us, we're a government entity, we're part of the executive branch, that's a crime under 18 U.S.C. 1001. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the statute that Martha Stewart, for example, was prosecuted under, just to give it a, an easy example. Mm -hmm. uh, and we require each and every one of our, the recipients of our survey to sign a certification with the senior executive officer um, stating that the information that's contained in this report are true. And if they lie, that is a, that is a federal crime. Uh, do you when we try to get information from some of these folks, um, they seem to duck and dodge, and we don't always get the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And I'm just wondering, um, do you feel that you're getting the kind of information that you need? My, my audit chief, who's begun the review of these, these surveys, we're, we're holding off doing our our full review until they're all in, which is, should be this week, um, has told me that the initial, his initial review 
that they've been very good responses. Uh, we've gotten a lot of detailed responses about use of funds, according to him. He thinks that he's encouraged that we're going to be able to do um, a very complete audit report. Uh, we'll have to take a look at that. And then obviously there's going to be follow-up. Uh, we're not just going to take the banks at their word. Uh, we're going to be doing follow-up as part of the audit process. Now, are you, are you staffed uh, up to uh, sufficiently? No. Um, we are, we're growing. We've been in existence a little bit under three months now. Um, we have about 25 people on staff. Um, we, are try we are aggressively hiring. It's been very difficult. Uh, the S383, uh, which is now in the House, uh, will help us grow. It, it gives us some hiring flexibility that we, that we desperately need. Uh, we're, we're striving to build towards about um, 100 to 125 initially. Um, so hiring is a challenge. Um, but I also don't want to leave the impression that it is only me and, and my staff of 25 standing between the taxpayers, uh, $2.9 trillion, and those who would try to take advantage of it. We're working with, with all of federal law enforcement, as well as some state law enforcement, uh, to make sure that we have the right protections in place. I see we have a vote coming, but I have a one, one question I've got to get out. Um, in your written testimony, you indicate, and I quote, that uh, you have begun an audit into the process under which the Bank of America received $45 billion in capital investment and is to receive a guarantee relating to approximately uh, $100 billion of toxic assets in four separate top, top transactions under three different top programs. You further state, and this is what I'm getting to. As to coordinated oversight, it has, it has been and will continue. Now, considering what you wrote in your testimony, um, I'm interested to know whether the Treasury knew about the $3.6 billion in bonuses awarded by Merrill Lynch in December, just before it was taken over by Bank of America. Did you know about that? Um, Congressman, I really can't talk about any matters that are, that are pending under review in our investigations. Uh, we, ha we have, it has been stated that we do have a pending investigation into the Merrill Lynch B of A bonus situation. I understand. Uh, well, let me ask you another way. Um, as, and and you, this may fall in the same category. Is that the kind, is this the kind of information, though, that would normally come through your office? Yes, Congressman. We would, we would ask those types of questions and we would expect to receive those types right. of answers. And you would expect to have, get truthful answers, is that right? It would also be a crime to lie to our office if we asked that question, if somebody gave an untruthful answer. That would also be a crime. So yes, we would expect truthful Very answers. Very well. Uh, I, I know that we've got a vote coming up, so I will. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll go to, uh, uh, Mr. We'll go to Mr. Issa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to try and focus a little bit of attention again on XBRL, and I apologize. I've been going between here and uh, the Circuit City bankruptcy hearing next door. Uh, and, uh, and actually, they have a lot in common since it cost Circuit City $30 million to get a $50 million dip financing package. Needless to say, their Chapter 11 was uh, short. Uh, but uh, without getting into whether TARP funds should be used for dip financing or encourage a debtor in possession financing to stop corporations from going bankrupt completely, uh, Mr. Horn, uh, Mr. Uh, Bogano, let me, let me t go toward you again. I think uh, I heard uh, Mr. Uh, Jordan kind of get on this, but I want to be absolutely sure. If XBRL were to be implemented going forward, well, let's go the other way. If, in fact, we were to use XBRL to try to drill down into where the TARP money has gone today, would you be able to do that? Yes, sir. With the uh, proper authority from the government, we would be able to provide the tool to be wielded by the government for oversight. So you could provide the tool. They would need to make sure they had access to the, the, the well, divergent we would, databases. We would, we would be uh, able to provide the standard uh, to be wielded as a tool, a dictionary, but it's not a system. It's not software. Sure, we realize that it's you, a, you allow standard. other people to develop s independently it's, software that use your right. technology. It's, it's similar, if you had asked me in 1993, would it make it easier to get information from people if we had the web? I would immediately answer you yes. It would be a quantum leap in the efficiency, time, and expense okay, to gather information. Right. So I guess, Mr. Horn, would you have the equivalent of Google now that we've established that it's like getting the web? Uh, would you have the ability to drill down? Well, I would love to be using that analogy. Um, 
Um, I think that the key is is that we would actually create something that would be ac to a greater extent even more actionable relative to this subject matter because we would be dealing with the numbers of events that are specifically related to the financial instances that would be involved. So the answer to that, Mr. Congressman, is yes, we would, we would be in that type of position. And then I think I'll, I'll shift. Uh, obviously, if we implemented this technology going forward, it wouldn't just be the two of you we'd be asking, but in fact, all our regulators would then have the tools to do this themselves. That is correct. And it would also be on the basis of um, the fact that we're asking through uh, Congresswoman Maloney and, and Congressman King um, and also in, in the Senate to uh, pass a bill that would allow access to the regulated data so it wouldn't just be the data that's publicly available but also the data that would be available only to those people who would have access for regulatory purposes. Okay. And then, Mr. Bolofsky, uh, when I when we had Mr. Kashkari, or Secretary Kashkari here a few minutes ago, uh, he answered in very, very many ways that, of course, he would love to have the ability to have more transparency, to, to know the value of these assets in order to value them and so on. But today, are we, in fact, as I, I'm going to lead a little bit here, are we, in fact, asking for repeatedly, and are you asking for repeatedly, production of documents almost in the way that attorneys do in a court case? where you have to know what you want, you ask for it, they turn it over to you. Often you have to sift through it and say, but it's not in a format I can use. Uh, can you, can you re-manipulate it and send it back to us? Is that pretty much what's going on in the delivery of uh, answers to your questions by the various TARP recipients? Um, no, Congressman. I, from what my audit chief tells me, we've gotten uh, good narrative answers that we think are going to be very useful. We, we uh, I was talking about production of data, not narrative answers. Well, we haven't know, Bank of Amer no, in, in fairness, Bank of America said they were solvent, so solvent that they could turn around and buy Merrill Lynch. Today we know that that's not true, that in fact we'd have been much better off having Merrill Lynch live or die on its own, B of A live or die on its own, and not have two organizations, perhaps too big to fail, be now two organizations made into one, too, too, too big to fail. So back to the question. You're receiving answers to your request, narrative answers. Uh, Mr. Kashkari, of course, if he asked for it, is receiving them. But the real question, the question that Mr. Horn was asked and answered was, do you, know, do you or does anyone in the federal government have the ability to basically ask the question if they have the access and get the answers from raw data, uh, diverse raw data, or do we in fact depend on often self-serving individuals at various large banks who do not want to fail to give us answers that cause us to give them money only to later get answers that they need more money. Uh, you can ask, uh, the gentleman's time's expired, but please answer the question. We've not asked for that type of raw data in, in part because it would be simply way too expensive for us to analyze it. So you, uh, if I can conclude, so you don't ask for the information because you couldn't analyze it. People are here today talking about the tools to analyze it both prospectively and, ret and retrospectively, and we, we're, we're being told, no, we're going to rely on companies to deliver us information you know, that the, have proven to be unreliable. The gentleman makes a point, if I may, and, sure. and that is, uh, Mr. Borofsky, how do you know if people are telling the truth if you don't have a con comprehensive database against which to analyze the bank's reports? What, what we're doing in our survey and how we're going to test these answers is, is there are several things that we've built into the survey. And it is a survey, let's, uh, to be very clear. We are initially, as the initial part of this audit, and this is a part one, relying on the bank's responses, but not, not in a vacuum. For example, we've asked them to make reference to their budgets and plans. You know, our, our experience is that when a bank gets a huge influx of cash, they don't just say, you know, have, have a party and start doing it. They budget, they plan for it. These TARP programs are expensive for some of these banks. Well, um, actually, so we AIG did have a party, if I remember uh, right. They did. They, they, they <laughs> may have, but uh, and this, many uh, of these financial institutions, they have a plans, they have budgets. We make reference to internal emails, internal planning, and we're going to test it against that. And again, if they do lie, if they do tell us a story, uh, and it doesn't match up with their internal documents, with their public statements, with, with data that we can later obtain, they'll have committed a crime, and we're going to investigate that thoroughly. And this, uh, and, and if I may say that this investigative party will continue. Uh, we have dozens, literally dozens of questions to ask the witnesses, but we're out of time. Uh, we're going to submit 
written questions as a follow-up to the witnesses, and I'll ask Mr. Issa and uh, Mr. Jordan to join me in this, uh, that will help to uh, fulfill the purpose of this particular meeting. Now, we have had uh, uh, a very patient panel here in front of us because this hearing has gone on over five hours. Uh, this, the title of the hearing, Peeling Back the Tarp, Exposing Treasury's Failure to Monitor the Ways Financial Institutions Are Using Taxpayer Funds Provided Under the Troubled Assets Relief Program. We know that we could be looking at as much as $3 trillion in funds that are coming uh, from our government, from the taxpayers, to these various Wall Street interests. It is a mind-boggling amount of money. And we also know that if Treasury does not have the capability to keep track of those funds, we're looking at a nightmare. And we're looking at, at a severe challenge to trust in the political system. We can worry about banks collapsing, but we also better worry about the trust that the American people should have in their government collapsing because that is the basis for our entire nation. It's all held together by trust. So I want to thank each of the witnesses for what they have done to try to take a path towards trust and towards accountability and towards reliability of the information which Congress has given. I want to thank you on behalf of this committee and on behalf of the American people. Uh, this uh, uh, committee meeting stands adjourned. Uh, but we will be back at this subject. I want uh, everyone here who is uh, paying attention to this to know this subcommittee will not relent in our uh, efforts to make sure that the people of the United States know how the, their tax dollars are being spent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.